focus on headline. All right, let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, uh, joining us in the studio, we have our reporters in Son Mian and Cha Yoon Kyung. Guys, welcome back. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to you guys. I hope you guys had a good weekend here. We're going to start things off with some politics, uh, domestic politics at that. The National Assembly, they're going to be kicking off... Uh, or they have kicked off for three days of the parliamentary questioning on Wednesday. This starting with politics, foreign affairs, unification, and security. Uh, this is where there's a whole lot of grilling that's going on. We have the ruling and opposition parties obviously expected to clash over the discharge of the contaminated water from Japan's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Uh, there's also a number of diplomatic row between uh, Korea and China. Uh, we've had uh, the Chinese ambassador to South Korea uh, say uh, a quite a criticism in <laughs> regards to uh, some of the things that are going on here in South Korea. Let's just uh, leave it at that. Let's take a look at some of the key points we should be paying attention to on the very first day of this. Mian, take us away here. Sure. So as we mentioned, the biggest topic is going to be the release of the Fukushima contaminated water since Japan is starting to get ready to release it. So the Democratic Party is expected to focus on the safety of the contaminated water and whether to resume imports of agriculture and marine products from Fukushima, whilst also pointing out the opacity of the government inspection team to Fukushima. Whilst, on the other hand, the People Power Party is expected to counter by saying that the DP is spreading unsubstantiated rumors, citing the report of the government inspection team to Fukushima and also claiming that it is causing damage to uh, fishermen. The debate is also going to be expected to focus on the results of uh, President Yoon's recent uh, series of summit diplomacies, including the March summit with Japan, the April state visit to the states, and the G7 summit. Uh, so the ruling party also plans to highlight the diplomatic achievement made by President Yoon, emphasizing that he has restored shuttle diplomacy with Japan and strengthened uh, trilateral cooperation with the United States and Japan. Of course, on the other hand, the DP is expected to criticize the government's overall diplomacy with Japan, including the government's solution to forced labor based on the third party reimbursement and also uh, point out the lack of economic achievement at these uh, various summits. Yeah, so again, I mean, usually, I mean, naturally so, there's going to be a whole lot of clashes uh, between the ruling and the opposition parties in any year that this is uh, this goes on here. But uh, all the more uh, this time around, as we've been seeing uh, sort of high tensions between the two rival parties here, but also the National Assembly uh, they voted today on the arrest motion of lawmakers uh, Yun Kwan Suk and uh, Lee Sung Man, uh, who are involved in election bribery charges and the, uh, the the scandal that we talked about with the envelope scandal, right? Uh, Yun Kwan, you're going to give us the details of this. That's right, SJ. National Assembly voted today for the potential arrest of two lawmakers accused of involving in a cash for a vote campaign ahead of the Democratic Party's 2021 leadership election. While well, prosecutors had sought arrest warrants for Yoon Kwan Seok and Lee Sung Man for their alleged involvement in a campaign distributing cash envelopes to Democratic Party members to help the candidate Song Young Gil win party chairmanship ahead of the national convention of the party in May 2021. To be more specific, Yoon was accused of bribing over 60 million won, which is around $46,530 to DP lawmakers. Lee handed campaign officials officials 10 million won in order to provide money to regional party officials. They both left the party last month after the allegations emerged and became independent. The prosecution sought arrest warrants for the two lawmakers on the 24th of last month, and this was reported to the National Assembly plenary session on the 30th of the same month. Now, do tell us, though, uh, what are the procedures and prospects for the voting in the National Assembly and also uh, following movements of the prosecution? Yes, SJ. Well, first and foremost, the motion on Yoon was voted down 139 versus 145 with nine abstentions, and the motion on Lee was rejected 
132 versus 155 with six abstentions. And National Assembly consent is necessary to arrest them because by law, legislators are immune from arrest while the parliament is in session, um, a measure designed to shield lawmakers from political persecution. In order for an arrest consent motion to pass, it requires majority support in a vote attended by at least half of all lawmakers. Whether the current motion will pass will likely be determined by DP lawmakers as the party holds a majority of 167 seats. Also, prosecutors started investigating into the consulting companies involved in cash for vote campaign ahead of the Democratic Party's 2021 leadership election. The Seoul Central uh, District Prosecutor's Office's Anti-Corruption Investigation Department 2 sent prosecutors and investigators to the consulting company A and related residences to execute search and seizure warrants earlier in the day. Now, of course, uh, we did talk about these uh, arrest uh, warrant motions. Uh, We've talked about previously when it was uh, the DP leader, uh, Lee Jae-myung. Mm-hmm. And uh, despite the fact that uh, the DP does have a vast majority of the seats in the National Assembly, it was actually a very close one. I believe it was like a difference of one uh, vote or so. And again, if they do feel that they are going to be a liability, we continue to talk about, we are now less than a year away from the general elections next year, mm-hmm. uh, which is going to be crucial uh, for the Democratic Party to maintain the power that they hold in the DP, whereas the, uh, the ruling People Power Party will try to take back the National National Assembly as for the longest time, the National Assembly and the DP kind of having the majority has been their biggest obstacle so far Mm -hmm. in pushing through a lot of uh, President Yoon Se Gyer's policies here. Uh, But nevertheless, we'll keep a close tab on this. Also, in efforts to end school violence, the Parliamentary Education Committee passed a revision bill this morning. uh, This to give more support to victims of school violence uh, and their recovery and treatment as well. That's one aspect of things I think people overlook. Uh, Now, at least uh, the lawmakers determined to provide provide legal framework to stamp out school violence and ensure uh, prompt resolution of school bullying cases. Mian, uh, tell us what amendments were made to the existing laws. Yes, yeah, so the revision consists of a set of our legislative support measures intended to replace a total of 36 school violence bills that have been pending in the committee amid growing demand for specialized support services for students who experience bullying in schools. Now, the bill is known as the Tong Sun Shil Prevention Bill, which is named after a prosecutor turned lawyer. Now, now, we all recall um, Chong's controversial appointment as the chief of the National Office of Investigation after it was revealed that his son was involved in the school violence and how the case was handled was at the center of controversy, which eventually led Chong to step down. Now, going back to the amendment to the Act on Prevention and Countermeasures Against School Violence, uh, this involves operation of a protection facility for victims of school violence at the National national level, and also the establishment of specialized institution for integrated support for victims of school violence. Also, now the superintendent or principal of a school can, um, for example, designate a legal professional to help victims with legal assistance services. In addition, um, school principals may take urgent measures such as changing the class of the offending student or suspending attendance if the victim wishes, and report to the review committee. And while such efforts to provide um, legal framework are welcomed, we all know for sure that more needs to be done to fundamentally eradicate school violence. Uh, For example, the Korean Federation of Teachers Associates stressed that whilst victims need counselling and support to overcome their trauma, uh, perpetrators also need to be held accountable for their actions, but to some way also give given the opportunity to change or otherwise, if we leave them as they are, they will continue to harm others others when they grow up and become adults. So if we don't implement these kind of necessary measures in parallel, the country will continue to face uh, these kinds of dreadful cases of school violence every year. I mean, you know, we've talked about this case with a number of experts on the program, and uh, we've had uh, different consensus from different experts and so forth. But uh, the one thing that really stood out 
was uh, we had a chance to talk to a uh, law professor uh, over at uh, Yonsei University, I believe. Uh, but uh, I remember what she was saying is that basically, though the the homeroom teachers are basically responsible mm-hmm. for trying to you know organize this thing where uh, they basically have to deal with not only having to teach mm-hmm. but also be part of this committee right and so you know it's extra work for them and oftentimes what they do is listen why don't you just apologize to him or her mm-hmm. and uh, just get this over with you guys are you know just young and you guys could deal with this blah 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 and there's not a whole lot of things put in place but also to just basically tell them to change class doesn't really make a huge difference mm-hmm. right i mean yeah. you know you change class sure. and it could be the the classroom next doors and who knows the the, the bully could come during break time or lunch time yeah. and bully him even more uh i mean again i mean there needs to be a harsher punishment yeah. is the consensus i think the bullying time. is actually done during the break and lunch time right. it's not during class right it's yeah. not during class when you're actually separated and and it's not there's no rules as to you cannot visit other exactly. classrooms during break time and that's the problem and also you have have to take into consideration after school mm-hmm. uh that's the other thing before school yeah uh and even if it means like switching schools right I, again i mean there's there's so many loopholes right now and one of the things that a lot of people are very afraid of is basically retaliation mm-hmm. from the bullies if they tell on uh the bully mm-hmm. and tell their parents or tell their teachers and things like that and that's that's the uh the the unfortunate uh, consequences of all this and uh, we do hope that there are some strict measures in place to deter them from uh, continuously bullying kids here. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the name of the Gangwon-do province, uh, this has changed, it's interesting, Gangwon State after 628 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, yung Kyung, give us more details on this. That's right, SJ. On the 11th, the name of Gangwon-do province has been changed to Gangwon State with a large-scale celebration. The name Gangwon-do has been used since King Taejo of Joseon in 1395, and this name is changed after 628 years. Kangwon State has been launched officially on the 11th as the third special autonomous region following Jeju and Sejong. Two days before its launch, a grand ceremony was held, and more than 2,000 provincial residents attended and celebrated the first step. Kangwon State was the president's representative regional commitment, and according to President Yoon seok it's not just a name change, and especially Special laws were created and empowered. The key is drastic regulatory reform. Currently, there are more than 40 regulations in Kangwon State for ecological conservation and fly safety areas, including Pekdudega Mountain Range and Water Source Conservation are. The area regulated by law alone amounts to 28,000 square kilometers, and it is 1.7 times of the total area of Kangwon State, which means that there are two or three layers of regulations. Therefore, the special law includes the regulation of the environment, forests, military, and agriculture sectors, and taking over authority from the government. The Kangwon Special Self-Governing Province Act will take effect on June 8th next year, a year after its promulgation. So enforcement ordinances, enforcement rules, and ordinances should be made for the next year. It is very unusual uh, for an area to be called a state, but uh, what other changes Mm -hmm. aside from that are we going to be seeing? Well, more than 2,400 government building and information signs are also subject to replacement. And the name of the administrative district, Kangwon State, will be used in civil affairs documents that will be issued from next week. And the English notation also changed. It is Kangwon State from the existing Kangwon province to emphasize decentralization. I'm looking at Wikipedia right now. The page was last edited on June 12, 2023. Uh, at, uh, that's today. Today. And they wrote, Kangwon State wow. is a province of South Korea and Ooh. is the least dense populated subdivision and so forth. I had no idea. Again, it's rare to hear an area called mm, state, state, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we often use that like in the United States, yeah, right? right. The, the state of New York and so right, forth. Right, right. Uh, mm-hmm. But I didn't know that there's actually a, a university called Kangwon State University. Oh. Uh, so oh. <laughs> they have been using, they have been using state, I think. Mm-hmm. Oh, it used to be Kangwon Provincial University and they even changed that right Today? now. Today? Oh my goodness. They're really enjoying this whole state status oh. right now. They've changed it. It used to be called Kangwon Provincial University 
And now it's Kangwon State University,、wow. ladies and gentlemen. So、uh, we all have to get used to this. We're very used to using Kangwon Province, Kangwon something、State. province, and so forth. It is now Kangwon State. They're they're enjoying this.、Uh, mm-hmm. Let's move on here. Talk about some、uh, foreign affairs. Uh, issues here.、Uh, tit for tat move after Beijing's envoy to South Korea was summoned last week over his、uh, comments accusing Seoul of tilting towards the United States. We had China、uh, call in South Korean Ambassador Chung Jae Ho and、uh, lodge a complaint.、Uh, we had the、uh, Beijing Foreign Ministry announcing this. Mian,、uh, walk us through、uh, this、uh, diplomatic row between Korea and China, which we have seen intensifying over the past few months now. Sure. So now let me just walk you through, and this just all began with a meeting held last week between the South Korean opposition leader Lee Jae Myung and Chinese Ambassador Shin Hai Ming. And in that meeting, Ambassador Shin accused Yoon's government of leaning excessively towards Seoul's treaty ally and the U.S. and damaging its relations with China. Now, Ambassador Shin said during the meeting that South Korea was entirely to blame for the many difficulties in the bilateral relations, citing its growing Trade deficit with China, which he attributed to de-Chinization efforts, apparently referring to action by South Korean companies to shift their supply chains away from China. So his comment quickly drew ire from Seoul. It was inappropriate comments from Ambassador Shin, which he could be accused of violating、uh, diplomatic protocols and interfering with South Korean domestic politics. So in response on Friday last week,、um, South Korean First Vice Foreign Minister Tang Ho Jin warned. Warned Ambassador Shin over his senseless and provocative remarks he made. So now China, of course, will not just sit back and watch their diplomats to be summoned. China's foreign ministry summoned Korea's ambassador to Beijing on Saturday to complain about Seoul's criticism of recent remarks made by Ambassador Shin. Now, in a statement released on Sunday by China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it said that its assistant foreign minister Nong Nol conveyed Beijing's serious concern. And dissatisfaction over Seoul's unfair reaction. Now, according to Chinese Ministry, Nong explained to Korean ambassador to China Chung Jae Ho on Saturday that it was Ambassador Shin's job to meet with various figures in Korea, adding that the meetings were meant to be promote understanding and cooperation between Seoul and Beijing. Meanwhile, it was late this afternoon that the present office、uh, left a comment that the role of an ambassador is to serve as a bridge. Between the home country and the host country, although、uh, the president office didn't make a direct comment referring to this case particular, but he made a further statement referring to the Article Forty One of the Vienna Convention, which requires diplomats to respect the laws of their host countries. And the same article also states that the diplomats are obligated no,、uh, not to interfere in the internal affairs of their host countries. Yeah, and not to mention, you have to understand the、uh, the government was very upset at the. Fact that also that Xin Haiming、uh, didn't meet with the foreign ministry officials of the ruling government,、mm. uh, but with the main opposition Democratic leader Lee Jae Myung, right?、Yeah. And so that was the other thing that really、uh, upset them. And then all the comments that were made. By the way,、uh, the talks、mm. between Xin Haiming. And also,、uh, Lee Jae Myung was conducted, I believe, fully in Korean because、uh, Shin Hae Ming is very fluent、oh. uh, in the Korean language.、Uh, mm-hmm. But nevertheless, which is why、uh, they were able to get all these information, all the things that was said、uh, in regards to you know Seoul's stance right now、uh, and quote unquote tilting towards the United States. But again, we've been seeing this growing. Diplomatic row between the two sides here. We'll have to see how much more、uh, this is going to further exacerbate the relations between the two neighboring countries. But in the meantime,、uh, another thing that we have to be worried about is、mm. the release of the contaminated water from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant.、Uh, we've been talking about this for some quite time.、Uh, starting today,、uh, Japan has been conducting and operating a test discharge of the contaminated water,、uh, and the plan. Is obviously facing fierce opposition, not just from neighboring countries like、mm-hmm. South Korea and China, but also I've mentioned this before: local fishermen in the Fukushima area,、right. even、uh, farmers in the Fukushima、uh, area, because they're saying that for the past ten years or so, they've been trying to improve their image after the nuclear disaster, and you're ruining things again. Well, it seems like、uh, there's going to be more tensions here because of the opposition from the local fishermen. Yoongyeong, you have、mm-hmm. more details on this. 
That's right, SJ. Starting Monday, Japan is carrying out a two-week test run for the process of discharging nuclear contaminated water from the wrecked Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. And this is according to Japan's local media Fukushima TV on Sunday, citing the plant's operator, the Tokyo Electric Power Company. It will ensure the safety of the discharging process during the test run. Although actual release does not happen, the start of the trial operations means a release could become imminent. Japan plans to have its water release system ready by the end of this month. A final report from the International Atomic Energy Agency about its inspection is expected in late June. Once everything is completed, Japan plans to release more than 1 million tons of contaminated water currently stored at the stricken power plant. Meanwhile, Japanese authorities are facing fierce opposition from local fishermen. Last Saturday, Japan's industry Industry Minister Yasutoshi Nishimura met with local fishery representatives to seek their understanding for the planned release. Representatives expressed grave concerns over the plan since it is fueling anxiety about the future of fishing operations. Nishimura said the government will provide more support to expand the consumption of fisheries products and continue working to develop the nation's fisheries industries. While well, Japan plans to release the contaminated water into the sea this summer, while pledging it would not dispose of the contaminated water without consent from concerned parties. If you remember, um, shortly after the accidents and so forth, uh, there was a whole lot of movement from the Japanese government trying to assure uh, consumers that uh, fish and agriculture from the Fukushima area was safe. And then you even had uh, the then uh, Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe, I should say now late Shinzo Abe, mm -hmm. uh, even trying out some of these agriculture from the Fukushima area and so forth. But still, that didn't really uh, change the way that people, not just the people in Japan, but all of over course. the world uh, to purchase uh, fish from Fukushima. I mean, there's even concern right now that people aren't even going to buy, uh, you know, fish from the East Coast, for instance, mm. or, or off the coast of Jeju, because it's all right, going to be right. impacted by the release of the, uh, the contaminated water. So, I mean, you could kind of imagine how many how concerned people are, especially the fishermen uh, in the Fukushima area. Uh, let's move on here. There's an interesting analysis that was revealed by the Wall Street Journal over the weekend that um, North Korea has stolen as much as 3.8 trillion won in cryptocurrency. That comes out to uh, about eight, uh, sorry, three billion U.S. dollars. Uh, this over in the past five years, uh, using its. Uh, hacking army, so to speak. They have a, a, a nice little army of hackers there. Uh, and this has been used to fund about half of his ballistic missiles. Uh, we had U.S. officials view the monies to believe to have funded about half of the uh, North Korea's ballistic missile program, including the nuclear development among with other things. Mian, uh, tell us more about the analysis. Yes, yeah, so now according to blockchain analytics from Chain Analysis, North Korea has amassed more than 3.8 trillion won, which is a 3 billion US dollars, in digital theft in the five years since it launched a major cryptocurrency attack in 2018. Now, uh, Ann Neuberger, White House Deputy National Security Council, who is the Director for Cyber and Emerging Technologies, uh, estimated that these these cyber operations provided roughly 50% of the foreign currency that North Korea uses to purchase foreign-made components for its ballistic missile programs. In particular, she said, um, North Korea's cryptocurrency attacks over the past year have been rampant against cryptocurrency centers around the world, resulting in a series of large-scale extortions. In particular, um, U.S. officials have estimated that North Korea operates a shadow army of thousands of IT war workers around the world, including in Russia and China, earning as much as $300,000 a year. And the, uh, was, the WSJ highlighted that case of Sky Mavis, a blockchain gaming company that lost more than $600 million to North Korea last year, which was a very interesting case. And they say that the engineer at the company was scouted by a recruiter on LinkedIn, uh, which turned out to be a member of North Korea's cyber attack unit. 
And similarly, North Korea's hacking armies pose as Canadian IT workers and Japanese blockchain development freelancers, according to the WSJ. And they even hire actors to interview for jobs on their behalf. Uh, That's what the investigators have revealed. And many experts believe that North Korea has begun to develop these digital bank robbery units to evade, you know, the harsh international sanction against them. Yeah, again, I mean, it's it's not the first time that they've done this to, you know, North Korean hackers, whether it be the Lazarus group and so forth. I mean, that's the only way to sort of go around, like you said, the, the international sanctions that are placed uh, in place for uh, North Korea here. Guys, uh, we're going to move on to some really shocking mm. news here. A uh, South Korean woman uh, in her 30s, uh, she is, I believe, uh, known to be an internet broadcaster right. with uh, over 250,000 uh, followers. She was found dead in Cambodia. We had a Chinese couple arrested for abandoning the body uh, near a water. Uh, Yung Kyung, tell us more about the details of this. Yes, SJ. Cambodian local media reported on Sunday that a South Korean woman in her 30s has been found dead in Cambodia, and the Chinese couple has been arrested on a charge of disposing of her body. And according to the Rosme Kampuchea newspaper and other local media outlets, the woman's body wrapped in red cloth was found in a puddle in a small town near Phnom Penh on Tuesday. The victim, who was identified as an internet broadcaster, was traveling in Cambodia at the time. The Chinese suspects allegedly confessed to abandoning the body after the victim began experiencing seizures and subsequently died while receiving treatment at a clinic they were running on June 4th. This is presumed that the victim died after receiving an intravenous um, solution or serum injection at the clinic, according to a local source. But there are also rumors that she was found with a swollen face, which raises the possibility of assault, the source said. Cambodian authorities are conducting an autopsy and initiative initiating legal proceedings against the suspects. The woman's bereaved family arrived in Cambodia, and an official at the Korean embassy in Cambodia mentioned that they plan to provide consular assistance to the bereaved family for funeral procedures. The embassy also said that if local police share the investigation, they will respond urgently by immediately reporting it to the Home Police Office and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It has yet to be decided whether whether to conduct an autopsy on the body. Cambodian police say an autopsy is needed to determine the exact cause of death, but they are waiting for the bereaved family's final decision. Meanwhile, a Vietnamese businessman with a local subsidiary in Cambodia said that there are many unauthorized hospitals in the country, especially medical facilities operated by Chinese people, which should be taken extra careful. Yeah, but the big question here is, again, someone who has about 250,000 subscribers and Mm. Uh, by the way, she's like in her 30s, but she doesn't look like she's in her 30s. She looks very young. Uh, why would she go to a shady clinic in Cambodia, mm. of all places, when she's from, of all places, South Korea, right, where you have some of the greatest uh, clinics uh, in, in the world? And so that's the big question. And you mentioned you raised a, uh, the suspicion that there was some kind of swollen face and so mm-hmm. forth. And we'll find out uh, what the deal is right now. But this is... Again, uh, you know, I know there's been, especially because of a certain TV show, there's been a boom in like world traveling amongst the mm, uh, the internet, right. uh, internet broadcasters and things like that. But the, the concerns that's always raised is when women travel alone, mm-hmm. uh, things like this it happen, and uh, for she. Uh, it's led to the death of a uh, relatively popular uh, internet broadcaster. Uh, let's move on over to talk about uh, Ukraine now. Uh, Ukraine is saying that its troops recaptured three of its villages uh, from the Russian forces in the southeast. And this is the first sort of victory uh, in liberating some of the uh, the territories since launching their counteroffensives is what they're saying. So let's get the latest updates here, Vian. Sure, so Kiev announced that with their counteroffensive measures gathering pace last week, uh, it claimed that it took three villages from the Russian invaders. Uh, in a series of early successes, Kiev's force claimed to have liberated Blahodatne, uh, Makryuka, and Neskunet, which are all villages in the country's eastern Donetsk region, uh, where 
that there has been a ramping up of operations. Now, Deputy Def- Defense Minister Hannah Mahler of Ukraine said via Telegram that troops were also advancing successfully in other areas and that no position was lost during defensive activities. Nonetheless, heavy fighting continues in frontline hotspots today, with some 25 battles taking places over across the region. But And also we have heard that President Vladimir Putin told the Belarusian leader that Russia will start deploying nuclear weapons in Belarus uh, when the necessary facilities there are ready in early June. It was actually the first time Russia's president has suggested, suggested a specific time frame for his plans to deploy tactical nuclear weapons to the country uh, just north of Ukraine, which is one of Russia's few allies in the region. Now, if Putin makes good on his plans, it will be the first deployment of Russian tactical nuclear weapons outside Russian territory since the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. In response, the Biden administration has condemned Russia's stated plan since it was first announced, and a National Security Council spokesperson on Friday called the move Another example of Belarus leader making irresponsible and provocative choices. Now, this was something that uh, we were very concerned about right now. Uh, you know, was it Ukraine has already started their counteroffensive and they're uh, with the assistance from its uh, Western allies. They're looking like they're going to be progressing relatively mm. easy. Right. And so Russia has their back to their wall right now. Um, and so their last sort of result is using these tactical nuclear weapons. Now, again, it's not like the ma- weapons of mass destruction or anything. It's mm-hmm. not like a huge, huge weapon, but still, it is going to take a huge toll on uh, people's lives, uh, Ukrainians' lives, I should say. And the argument that was made by Russia initially when they announced that they were going to move these technical nuclear weapons to Belarus was, hey, listen, the United States does this too. They have all these technical nuclear weapons all around the world. Yeah. Why can't we do it? And, you know, Belarus is, you know, great friends of ours and they're allowing us to do it. What's different? Well, the difference is, it seems, well, while the uh, the U.S. doesn't necessarily use these technical nuclear weapons uh, after placing in their allied countries, the consensus is that Russia might actually use yeah. the technical nuclear weapons, and that is going to change the landscape of this war right now. Of course. And it is very, very concerning here. Uh, yeah. So July is the set timeline here. Let's move on. Uh not often we do this, but uh, we're going to round things out with some, I guess, some positive news here. We, we, we need some positivity oh, yes. on this Monday. Uh, mm-hmm. We had some behind-the-scenes stories about, I'm sure maybe some of our listeners have heard this story, uh, four siblings uh, who were lost in the Amazon jungle. They were mi- miraculously rescued. Uh, they were basically trapped in the Amazon for 40 days, ladies mm-hmm. and gentlemen. And uh, the, the secret to the survival of uh, the four siblings reported to be cassava powder and seeds is what they ate. Uh, Yoon Kyung, uh, give us a story on this. Yes, SJ. According to the BBC and The Guardian on the 10th local time, the uncle of four siblings, Fidencio Valencia, said that when the plane crashed, the children took out farina from the wreckage and survived through it. Farina refers to the cassava powder used in the Amazon region. And cassava is a root plant that looks like a sweet potato and is known as a carbohydrate-rich crop. According to the children's uncle, after running out of farina, the children began to eat seeds, which also helped them survive. AFP reported that children were able to have prior knowledge of that seeds, roots, and plants they could eat thanks to native home education in the Amazon region. Fatima Valencia, a grandmother of four siblings, especially stressed that Leslie Mukutui, the eldest sister, played the role of the eldest. She said that Leslie was able to take care of her siblings and not be panicked because of the situation because she was used to. Fatima, the grandmother, said Leslie brought grain powder, cassava bread, and a fruit in the bushes in her sibling, uh, to her siblings. They knew what they needed to eat. However, Commander the Pedro Sanchez, who was in charge of the rescue operation, said in an interview with the Associated Press that at the time of the discovery, the children could barely breathe or pick up small fruits around them. According to Colombian defense minister, children are still struggling to eat food, but they are gradually recovering. They also began to talk little by little. 
Colombian、uh, President Gustavo Petro called the children good example of survival and said the story of the four siblings will go down in history. Leslie and four other siblings were rescued safely on the 9th of this month, 40 days after a light plane crash in the Amazon jungle in southern Colombia on the 1st of last month. All three adults, including the mother and pilot of the children who were on the light plane together, were found dead on the 15th day of the accident. Again, I mean, just、uh, what turned out to be what was、uh, truly a. Just a, a sad story of tragedy, right?、Mm-hmm. Uh, turned into a miraculous story. And again, at the, year, at the age of 13 years,、uh, right. to be able to not only、uh, you know, survive on your own, but take care of your siblings,、mm-hmm. it's a whole lot of. Of course.、Uh, it's really, really tough. And 40 to days is a long period. 40 days, right? I, I can't more even. More than a month. I can't even survive the streets of Seoul sometimes、Pretty、for、much. two hours.、Uh, how they're able to do this.、Mm-hmm. And we've got a whole bunch of messages coming in. Uh, from our、uh, listeners' cases, a 13 year old who looked after her siblings, including a one year old, is a legend. She really paid、right. attention to what her grandmother taught her. And so,、mm-hmm. every little thing, s right, like you learn in life,、uh, mm-hmm. it always comes in handy. You just you never prepare for like an per- airplane crash and being stranded in the Amazon forest for 40 days. But it's the little things that you,、uh, you, you know, learn here and there that'll help you eventually. And so, Definitely an amazing story, but still a tragedy、uh, mm-hmm. because, again,、uh, the, the three adults were, of course, found dead、mm. uh, in the 15th day there. But, nevertheless, guys,、uh, thank you very much for your reports today. Have a safe rest of the night, and we'll see you guys again. Thank you. Thank you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.